Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Before we get started today, I have a couple of announcements for you. If you are an intuitive, a hyper empath, a light worker, a highly sensitive person, or any of those terms that kind of collectively describe the spiritual entrepreneurs, I have something for you. I've got this one of a kind protocol, which is going to help you activate your own personal energy shield to protect yourself against the weight of the world. This is one of my go-to energy practices that I implement in my life every single day. It's made such a difference to me in terms of how I'm able to manage my own energy, notice other people's energy, being able to discern between the two, what's mine, what's somebody else's. And it's the number one tool that I teach all of my private clients because all of you who work with me privately know this already, how sensitive we are to other people's energies. And unless and until you can really get a sense of what's yours and what somebody else's, there's gonna be a lot of muddiness in your field. If you're going to be channeling high frequencies like wealth consciousness for prosperity on all levels, like I know so many, like all spiritual entrepreneurs desire to do, then creating a beautiful shield around you to hold and to refine your own energy is super important. So if you wanna grab that protocol, I've created it just for you, it's a gift. You just go to my website, drrobinmckay.com forward slash shield, and you can download that protocol and start using it ASAP. And we'll be sure to put the link in the show notes. That's the first announcement. The second one is that I've really felt a deep calling to start holding retreats in Scottsdale this fall and winter. I've had some requests coming in from my private clients, as well as just some of the community members around me who are saying now is the time to do these in-person retreats. So if you're wanting to make a major shift in your life, one of the fastest and most efficient ways of making that transformation is to do a deep dive into a retreat. To have a container that holds you for three or four days creates the conditions for you to come out a completely different version of yourself than when you went in. I know certainly for me in my life, as I've gone through my own transformations, retreats have been an integral piece of my transformation story and journey. And I always love to hold containers and to move through the journey of the retreat with my clients as well. So if that's something that you're feeling called to, I have a small number of those retreats available this fall and winter in Scottsdale, Arizona, at one of our beautiful resorts here in the Valley. There's no better time to come to Arizona than in the winter when everything else is dead cold. It is beautiful here. And it's one of my favorite times of year. It's and this is one of my favorite, most holy places on the planet. So you're invited to join me to start that conversation. All you have to do is book a consult with me. Go to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call, and you'll be taken to my schedule where you can find a time that works for you to have a chat about what you're wanting to create in your life. These retreats are really great for high achieving, ambitious leaders who are emotionally intelligent. You can be in spiritual entrepreneurship. Quite frankly, a lot of the people who are coming in for retreats are still coming from corporate. They're wanting to make the leap into entrepreneurship to consulting and starting their own businesses. So that is something that we focus on during the retreats, as well as getting you shored up in terms of your own wealth consciousness and recovering from burnout. So you can go out and do your best work in the world. I'm looking forward to having that conversation with you if that's something that you are really feeling called to this year. Oh, and by the way, after you schedule your call, you'll be guided to complete an assessment form. It's very important that you do that before we get on the call. It's my way of being able to really study and understand you, who you are, and what your unique desires are to make sure I can support you. And if I can, we'll go forward with the call and we'll have a great conversation about how you and I can work together to bring about the transformation that's really right for you right now. And now, as I always say, on with the show. All right, today I'm doing a solo episode and I'm gonna share some things from my heart that have come forward in about the last week or two. You know, earlier this month, my husband was gone for five days. He was out visiting his son in the East Coast. So I was here at home by myself. Well, Cooper Mack, of course, was here with me. 
And I was just able to be in my own energy, no music, no TV, very limited energetic influences, just so I could start hearing myself again. I think it's really important for me to be able to be in my own energy and really feel what I'm feeling and to be able to hear my guides, to be able to hear the, the divine guidance that I receive um, in an unfettered way. So while I was on my own, I started having the, these sort of existential breakthroughs, I'll say, <laughs> I don't know what else to call them really, um, that have led me down this path of something that I want to share today, which, which I'll get to in a second, but I want to start back a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I had a friend call me to say that she became aware of one of our colleagues who is not doing well physically, most likely is dying. And I'm usually pretty good with death. I've walked people to the gates of heaven before. I understand that life goes on after death. Dead people communicate with me pretty often in my, in my personal life and in my work as well. So it wasn't that, but that, that just hit different, I think, just because it's somebody who I know and somebody who I've, I've known for a long time. So that was a piece of it. And then I was reading this book, a work of fiction. I love to read fiction, especially at night before I go to bed. And in this book, it's called, I think it's called Five Years Later, Five Years From Now, something like that. We'll put the link in the, in the show notes so you can have a look at it. But anyway, spoiler alert, there is, um, there's a character in the book who ends up contracting cancer and dying young. And so between the phone call from my friend and then this book, where one of the main characters is dying of cancer. I was up that night after reading that passage in the book where it was revealed that she was dying and there was a whole like conflict between the protagonist and this character that sort of got resolved during the time I was reading that night. But I was just deep seated sobbing that night. And I share this with you, obviously not to, you know, create the conditions for you to feel bad for me or anything like that, but just to share, like it touched something deep inside of me. And I remember that night as I was processing through my tears and reading and kind of going back and forth between journaling and reading the book and thinking about my, the conversation that I had with my friend and this, this thing erupted inside of me, this voice of my soul erupted inside of me. And what I realized, and I spoke this out loud that night, I said, everybody is going to die. Everybody is going to die. And then I said something that I've never said before, even thought before, but I said, I can no longer give myself over to superficial things. I can no longer give myself over to the artifice of life. Everything in my life has to be grounded in meaning and purpose. I have to make my life count. I have to make sure that every moment of my life is whole, holy, that I remember it, that I'm in it. We have this tendency, even as people who are in the transformational space of kind of skimming along the surface, of replicating experiences over and over and over again. And even when we try not to, we sort of get on this gerbil wheel of doing the same thing we've always done, having the same thing for breakfast, lather, rinse, repeat, not doing too many things differently, especially I think when we get to a point in our careers or our lives where things are going pretty well. We've established ourselves as experts, as leaders. We have all the sort of things that we desired when we were younger, right? We've got the credentials, we've got the awards, we've got the experiences, we've got the street credit. We have all the things, the car, the house, the family. And then when we get to that point, we work so hard to get here. And I say we, because I know it's not just me. I know it's you too. We've worked so hard to get to where we are now that sometimes it is nice to just rest for a minute, to use the plateau to recover, 
to reflect and to decide what's next. But unless and until we actually decide what's next, we can get in that gerbil wheel that we wanted to get out of to begin with. The gerbil wheel that created burnout, the gerbil wheel that created boredom, the gerbil wheel that, that created the lives that we have in some ways, but also those tracks get laid deep into the ground. And it's sometimes hard to get off the track of your life once you have laid down the track, if that makes sense. So that night that I was having this existential experience of recognizing, truly recognizing that nobody gets out of this life alive. Not you, not me, not any of us. The death rate is 100% on this planet. I know that my consciousness goes on. I know that your consciousness is eternal. But our physical bodies will at some point expire. And that night, as I was reflecting and journaling and really feeling into this experience of knowing in my bones that everybody's going to die and that I can no longer give myself over to superficial things, that opened a portal for me in my life that would then play out in the following week. After that night, my husband arrived back home. I welcomed him with open arms. It was great to have him back. Cooper was happy to see him. And we got on with our lives as we do. He recovered from burnout. I was going to the gym, preparing dinner, taking Cooper Mac for walks, just doing all the things that we do in life that I do in life. And then I had a uh, an intensive booked with my coach. I work very closely with Jennifer Longmore and have for years. She's a wealth consciousness coach, a business coach for spiritual leaders. And she's somebody who, since she's been in my life, my life has improved significantly. Okay. It's unrecognizable actually how my life has, has changed in the last probably six years since I've been working with her. But anyway, periodically I get together with her for a three hour intensive. And that intensive happened last Thursday. So probably like around the 23rd or 24th of August, if you're listening to this, when this, when this episode comes out. So when we lead up into these intensives, there's always sort of an understanding of what we're going to be focusing on, which is for me, what's next. That was the big question. It has been a question in my business for a while now, what's next? And so she kicked off the, the intensive with a really important question about full circle moments. What's the thing she asked that has come full circle for you? What's the thing that you let go of a long time ago, but is now coming back into your awareness is something that's important to focus on. And I have to be honest, I was a little stymied by that. Hadn't thought of it. And sometimes I'm not like, I don't think well on my feet sometimes. Maybe it's my ADHD brain, but I don't always create well. I don't always recall things in the way that I would wish I could. So I was quiet for a moment or two, and I kind of scanned and wondered and thought about it. And I probably said something. And finally, she said, well, I'm looking back at these notes that I've kept over the time we've worked together. And the thing that keeps coming up periodically for you is about horses. She said, what's the deal with horses? So that's what I'm going to talk about today are the horses, because as we explored during the intensive, what I came to realize is that horses have always been a part of my story from the time I was little girl, but um, they are something more recently that has come back into my awareness as being important. So I want to, I want to teach you, I want to tell you that story about how the horses have affected my life. And what I'm thinking about now when it comes to horses and transformation and the existential work that I'm deep in myself and also obviously always working with my clients on as well. And so we're going to start there today. And as I do start, I will say that um, the horses are all around right now. They are, I'm part of a herd an energetic herd, and I have been for a long time. But during the intensive, they definitely came back in. In fact, 
you know, I see things in my mind's eye most of the time. My my clairvoyance is is in my inner vision. Most of the time I see things playing out like a movie in my mind's eye. But that day during that intensive, they came in and I saw them as holograms. Not full on like I would see you if you were in the same room with me, but I could definitely see and sense their presence in the room. And they're probably in the room with me, there were probably about 12 big horses that came in and joined us that day. And they've stayed with me. And as I'm doing this recording today, they're with me here today. I actually called them in before we started recording. So they're here. So let me just tune in here and see where we want to start with channeling the wild horses. When I think about horses in my life, I can't remember a time when I wasn't fascinated by them. I grew up in Western South Dakota, which is known for rodeos and ranches and cowboys and quarter horses and barrel races. And though I never participated or rode when I was a kid, in those events, they were always around. The horses were always around. My elementary school friends, Travis and Jimmy and their families all had the horses in the, in the parades every year. So I was always around the horses. Miss Rodeo South Dakota was always riding her horses in the parades and so on. And then when I was about 12, I met my friend, Anne, whose dad and granddad had ranches in Western or in Eastern Wyoming, which is right across the South Dakota border. And so I ended up going out and spending a lot of time at her ranches and her granddad would put me on a horse and we'd go out and move cattle. Thank God the horse knew what he was doing because I certainly didn't. I was just along for the ride, but I loved it. I loved being out on the open prairie. I loved being in the expansiveness of the blue sky. I loved moving with the freedom of the horse and feeling the sway of his hips under my own. I loved everything about it. And so flash forward to the beginning of my spiritual awakening. So I'm gonna peg this at probably 2002, 2003, something in there. I came down actually to Arizona from Kansas to Miraville Spa in Tucson. And they had this equine experience. And at the time there was this movie that had come out, I think it was called 30 days or something like that. Sandra Bullock st uh, starred in it. it was about addiction recovery. And she has this experience with the horse, which then made this whole equine experience thing kind of famous or brought it to light to more people. And I had thought, oh, I really wanted to do that experience. Well, it turns out at Miraville, they had Wyatt Webb there who was one of the originators of this equine experience, this equine therapy. The original horse whisperer was his name. And I went and did this equine experience while I was there. I had two opportunities to work with horses. One was a really simple exper experience. It was just to clean a horse's hoof. So I chose my horse, her name was Annie. I remember she was this big, white, beautiful mare with ribbons in her hair. She's probably, if I were a horse, that would have been me, the horse version of myself. And I walked over to her. I learned how to clean hooves. I'd never done that before. But the whole thing was that you had to ask the horse to lift its foot, which is actually a very challenging thing to do because it is an act of trust on behalf of the horse to lift its foot, to allow a human to clean it. It is an act of trust and it is a profoundly vulnerable state for the horse to put herself in. And so I tried a couple of times and Annie was not budging her foot at all. Like there was no way that horse was lifting her foot for me based on what I had been doing at the time. And then all of a sudden, one of the, uh, one of the facilitators came over and he chatted with me for a minute. I got a little bit teary. I was frustrated because I was able to do everything well. I got A pluses in school. Why can't I lift a horse's foot? Like, what is the problem? 
And what I didn't realize at the time that the problem was that I was trying to do it all by myself. I wasn't partnering with Annie, the horse. I was just trying to make her, I was trying to force it. So I went back in the next time and I walked up to her confidently after having chatted with the facilitator, I took a deep breath and I walked back in and I just asked. And I remember I nudged her shoulder just a little bit and sure enough, she raised her foot, I cleaned her hoof and I was happy. And I loved that experience. So the next part of that day at Miraval, the next exercise was in the lunging ring. And a lunging ring is a pretty small arena where the horse goes in the middle. And the whole idea of this exercise was to ask the horse to move from a standstill to a walk, to a trot, to a canter without touching the horse. Now I did have a lunging, I forget what it's called. It's not a whip, but it's like a, it's a lunging guy. I'll call it a lunging guide. So I'm holding the lunging guide, but I can't touch the horse. So I just have to ask it to move. It's basically an extension of my hand. And I remember watching some other people going first and being in my own experience of like, I'm the A student and I should be able to do everything really, really well. And this should be, I should be able to do this. So I was doing a lot of shooting of myself at the time, which is pretty common among people who are just awakening. And it's my turn to get into the lunging ring. I walk in, I take the crop, it's called a crop. And I connect in with the horse as much as I know how to do. It's called joining, but I connect in as much as I know how to do. So I imagine my heart connecting in with the horse's heart. This is a different horse than Annie. But I connect in and then I ask it to move from standing to walking. And the horse does. So now the horse is walking around the arena as I'm asking it to, guiding it to, partnering with it. And then the facilitator says, okay, now increase your energy and ask the horse to trot. So I increase my energy and the horse begins to trot with me around the ring. And so we do that for a couple of, a couple of rounds and I start getting feeling a little bit dizzy because now I'm going in circles too. And finally the facilitator says, okay, canter, go raise your energy and ask the horse to canter. And I could not get there. Like literally, like nothing I was doing again was working. So we take time out. The facilitator comes over. We have this moment of processing, like what's going on. And I don't remember exactly what was said, but I do remember getting back in the, the arena with the horse and taking it very quickly from, a, you know, from standing to walking to trotting. And then I just there was something that opened up in my third chakra, like this big burst of energy that opened up and I felt it connect in with the horse's hindquarters. And at that moment, the horse cantered. It was amazing breakthrough moment. And I came out of that experience with that horse just so ecstatic that I was able to, that I was able to create this experience with the horse. So that was years ago. And in the ensuing years, the horses came in and out of my life. During grad school, I actually had the opportunity to learn how to do equine team builds and equine assisted leadership interventions, working with horses when I lived on the farm with Barb in Kansas. And later when I moved to Arizona, one of my colleagues actually had, a, had a, an arena, had a stables. And I would bring over the women in science and engineering students from ASU to the stables, and we would do equine assisted team builds as well. So I was always kind of on the periphery. They were never my horses. I was always the visitor. And I always said, I, always, I know the people, you know, the horses, let's get together and do this work. And that's how it worked for much of the time. So I did that pretty consistently up until about 2015, even my executive coaching clients and my entrepreneurship clients, when they would come to Scottsdale, we'd go over to the arena and we would do an intervention with the horses because it was just that powerful of an experience. The last time I did anything like that with any of my clients was probably 
I want to say at, at the latest 2016. So for the last seven years or so, the horses have been quiet for me until a week ago when I had my intensive with Jennifer. And during that intensive, what came forward was the vision that I've had for my business almost since it, its inception, almost since I started doing this work, I had this vision. And I want to share my vision with you. My vision is a retreat center with a horse sanctuary that we can come in and work with you and people like you. You can come in and make yourself at home and be welcome and find a sense of belonging, a sense of place. And we can be with the horses to observe and experience them in as much of nature as we can possibly give them without saddles, just being horses. Because in truth, what I remembered on last week when I was in the intensive is that horses really are the symbol of freedom, sovereignty, expansiveness. And during my intensive, when the horses all came in, in we'll say 5D, in the holographic form, I really had that sense of remembering how important, how important it is to tap into that sense of freedom and sovereignty and expansiveness that the horses represent. And as if to punctuate my awareness, the lead mare in this holographic herd of horses came over to me and nudged me with her nose right in my heart. It was activating to me. It was an acknowledgement of affection and of welcome and of invitation. And while I was in that place of deep introspection of what's next for my business and what's next for my life, the horses energetically are all around me. I start thinking about something. I start thinking about the wild horses that live on the Salt River in Arizona, not more than 15 miles from my house. And I've seen them in the past. They're well known in the area. People love to go see the wild horses. They really just hang out down at the Salt River. They graze in Tonto National Forest. They're protected by the government. Um, and I was remembering them and I just thought, I really want to go see the wild horses. I wanna find the wild horses. Well, the wild horses are not like going to the zoo. Like you don't like drive up and there are the wild horses off to your left. They have like thousands of acres that they can be on. There are over 300 in the herd. And so after Jennifer and I closed the intensive that day, I went into more deep meditation about the horses. My vision for what is next in my work came in full. Like I can see where I'm going now. It's been a little while. I've been kind of waiting for it to drop in and it dropped in. And I always know I can see my vision when I can close my eyes and imagine waking up in the morning and I can see the whole day running through. I can see what I'm doing every moment of the day in the future. That's how I know. That's how I know I've got my vision. So the horses are definitely in that vision. And I also know that the wild horses in reality are somewhere 15 miles, at least from me, somewhere in Tonto National Forest. And I also know that it's not like going to the zoo. So in the next couple of days, that was a Thursday, Friday, I have these big dreams early in the morning. I feel my energy just expanding and expanding and expanding. Like uh, the people who um, experience shamanic uh, breakthroughs will have this experience of their bodies and their, and their spirits just getting huge. And that's how I felt. And I felt myself also shape-shifting into a horse, of course. But all the while I was calling them in. 
And on Saturday, I said to my husband, I said, I really want to go see if we can find the wild horses. You want to come with me? And he said, yeah, I'm up for that. And listen, my husband's a Yankees fan and Yankees fans are notorious for downplaying any chances of success of anything because they don't want to be disappointed. And they've been disappointed way too many times in their lives with regard to baseball. So he said, but I don't think we're going to find them. And I understand what that is. That's his way of, he wants to be surprised, but he's not going to expect that we're going to find them. So I get that. And I just suggested, well, maybe we'll treat it like when we go whale watching or when we come across deer, when we're in Sedona, it just is a beautiful surprise. And he said, that's great. So I did a little bit of investigating on where the most likely places were for the horses to, to be during that time of day around sunset. And so we went and got a quick bite to eat for dinner, came home, got Cooper, and then headed out east toward Tonto National Forest. We're on the Beeline Highway, we're headed north. And just before the exit to the Bush Highway, I see out of the corner of my eye, because my husband's driving probably 70 miles an hour, out of the corner of my eye, I see this flash of white. And I turn back and I look and I'm, I said to him, there they are, they're right there. Literally, you guys, they were standing as close to the side of the highway as they could get because there's a fence line. There were probably 20 of them, 19 or 20 of them grazing there. And so Michael pulls over to the side of the road. We get out very quietly, very peacefully, very intentionally to go and observe and experience these majestic miracle workers being themselves, being wild horses. And it was an interesting experience because while we were there, I know enough about horse behavior to be able to read some of it. And there were many of the horses, let's say that there were 19 horses in this part of the herd. There were many of them who were grazing just peacefully. They were aware we were there, but they were peacefully grazing. But there were a couple who were always on alert watching. And if you go over to my Facebook page, I have my, my um, banner picture is of me with the horses. And you can see two full-faced looking right at the camera as the picture is taken. They were very aware and conscious that we were there which is to be expected. And, you know, the whole time I was there, here's what I was struck by is one is that they were right there. And I know that you could call it a coincidence. You could say, well, you know, you just got lucky. But I also know that I spent two days commuting with them in the etheric plane. I also know that I, called to them and they called to me and we connected etherically. And I know this because when I put my feet on the ground on the Arizona desert, and I stood in front of these beautiful, magical miracle workers, I knew that they had called to me and I had called to them. And I was a part of them and they were a part of me. We spent about 30 minutes enjoying their presence. We took some pictures. I just quietly connected with them heart to heart, feeling into their heartbeats, feeling into the, the frequency of the herd, just recognizing how precious they are and how free they are. And how they're just being, they're just being horses. And they were magical. And it was one of the peak moments of my life. And it gave me so much hope. Because as we left that day, we put, got back in the car, headed back to town, went and got some gelato at the end, because what better way to top off seeing wild horses than with some really good gelato. But as I reflected on that, I thought, you know what, if I can call in a herd of wild horses, Anything is possible. I can do anything.
And I share that not to brag, and I don't think that you would take that as bragging, but just as a confirmation and an affirmation that I'm on the right path. that what's to come is unfolding as it should. And that my work right now is to just keep connecting in with the vision, to keep connecting in with the spirit of the retreat center, to keep connecting in with the spirit of the horse sanctuary. Because here's what I know for sure is that the expansiveness of that vision is big enough for me. It's not boring. but it's not unwieldy either. It just feels normal. So I'm gonna kind of shift gears for a second because in some ways this is about me sharing my experience with you, but it's always more from where I'm sitting about how does my experience inform, inspire, bump up against your own experience? Do you know what the next level of your vision is? Can you really truly see it, taste it, touch it, feel it? Can you call it in so it shows up in physical form? It's possible, but chances are pretty good, I think, that for most people, especially for most people in my community, you're visionary, for sure. You're empathic, for sure you're a business owner, you're a leader, and you might be feeling a lot like you are on the gerbil wheel. Like you've been there, done that, wrote the book, got the t-shirt and the coffee mug. But what I want to just invite you into today is the possibility that this is not all there is, that in fact, you do have a whole lot of life left to lead, to create, to contribute before you leave. But we don't know how long we have left. None of us do. None of us do. And everybody is going to die. So not to get heavy and not to get you know morbid, but just to really reflect on what, what your vision is and to tune into what that is and to not just know it, but to feel it and to be able to live it out. These are going to be the exercises and the, the experiences that make all the difference for you, that get you out of the burnout and get you out of the boredom and get you moving again, get your wealth consciousness flowing again, liberate your consciousness get you back into your sovereign, sacred autonomy, get you back into your sense of freedom, just like the horses did for me. And maybe the horses are meant to do that for you too. That's why at the beginning of the podcast today, I made the announcement about the retreats that I'm going to be hosting this fall and winter in Arizona. And you can bet horses are gonna be a part of that retreat. So I want you to just consider that. You can always call me, have a conversation, drrobinmckay.com forward slash call, get on my schedule. We can have a conversation about the horses and about your vision. And this is a little bit of a vision quest, actually. The horses are our guides. They're our partners and they are miracle workers. And I'm one of their guardians. And maybe you are too, but for sure we know this is that the horses are polarizing. And there are some people who are repelled by them and there are some people who are so magnetized by them. And maybe that's you because it certainly is me. And if that is, it's probably time we have a conversation. Okay. So I'm going to close out for today, sending you a million blessings. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, to listening to my story to allowing me into your, into your ears and into your, into your world. This is where the transformation starts. It starts in our imagination. It starts with getting really clear about what the vision is, what the feeling is that goes along with the vision. And then 
tweaking our everyday lives in order to bring about major transformations for prosperity on all levels. Until next time. <laughs>